Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, PCI Compliance, What Problem Are We Trying to Solve? I'm Melanie Jewell, Tripwire's Marketing Manager for APAC, and I'm excited to be moderating today's session. Before we start, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and the volume it is, is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the right top corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you are not seeing the slide movements in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the presentation. Our presenters today are Mario Sist, Principal Consultant at Underwriter Laboratories. With over 28 years in banking IT, Mario Sist is one of Australia's most experienced credit card security consultants and is a Visa PIN security assessor and a payment card industry qualified security assessor. He is joined today by Tripwire's very own David Bell, a systems engineer who brings a wealth of experience providing technical security expertise to Tripwire's customers and organisations across Australia. To learn more about our presenters, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your screen. Welcome, gentlemen. So now, without further delay, I'll turn it over to Mario. Take it away, Mario. Thanks, Melanie. Hi, David. How are you? Good, thanks, Mario. Yourself? Yeah, well, so let's get stuck straight into it. We'll be covering a number of topics today. We'll be going through an introduction and looking at a historical background and the current threat landscape, looking how PCI fits into the security framework, why, it's, uh, why PCI is important to your organisation, and why uh, getting a QSA can help, how Tripwire can help, and a few takeaways. So let's get stuck into the content. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the threat landscape and a little bit about the historical background of PCI. I think we're all aware that cybercrime is around us everywhere and it's increasing. Um, the global impact of cybercrime is estimated at three trillion US dollars, making it more profitable than the um, illicit drug trade. Um, definitely something that we should all be concerned about. In Australia specifically, um, cybercrime is up 20% based on 2014 figures with an estimated cost of $1 billion. In 2014, card not present fraud in Australia increased by 42%. So the, the last sets of slides that we're trying to illustrate that cybercrime is something that's with us as a society and something that's on, on the increase. I've been doing uh, IT for a very long time and I must admit when I started cybercrime wasn't something we thought about too much at all, but it's definitely top of, top of the mind. Well, I'll start going into a little bit about um, PCI and the payment industry for those that aren't familiar about it, familiar with it. But a lot of people talk about PCI as a certificate. And if there's one takeaway I want you to get from this session is don't think about PCI as a certificate. A certificate will not stop criminals. Um, they're not interested in your certificate. It's not really what it's all about. Um, and I'll explain what purpose the certificate actually has, but definitely don't focus on the certificate. Before I go too much further, I just want to state that the views expressed by me are my views and not mine of my employers, underwriter laboratories, or those of Tripwire. So please, uh, no quotes saying Tripwire said this or underwriter laboratories said that. 
Uh, but definitely if you want to say Mario just said something, that, that's okay. I have people saying that to me all the time, so that's something I'm, I'm quite used to. Okay, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about the payment industry. And the payment industry is um, peculiar to those who aren't familiar with it. Um, it's not a straight business to consumer biz, uh, business model. So you know you, do, you don't sell something straight to consumers, nor is it a straight um, business to business uh, model. It's actually a whole ecosystem. And the cards industry really started way back in the early 1900s. Um, prior to the 1900s, you would always find retailers who would set up a, a tab or a, or a slate for people and they could buy goods and they would um, tally up how much the, that person owed and maybe at the end of the month they would, they would pay their tab, which meant that they didn't have a whole lot of cash. But with the introduction of, of the automobile, and mainly in the US market, um, people travelled a lot. So you, you're at locations where the retailer didn't know you anymore. And definitely the oil companies saw this as a bit of a problem, that, that people would run out of fuel not have the, the money on them to pay for it, but they wanted to give them a way of paying. So a card was given to them, and, and the main purpose of the card was to identify this person as someone being trustful and a way of, of linking that person to some sort of internal account system so they could work out how much that person owed and then they could um, settle that account regularly. And actually not much has changed since the early 1800s. So it's been a model that's been around for a long time. Um, within the industry, we have a whole lot of jargon. Um, and unless you're in the industry, a lot of these terms might not mean a lot to you. And if you are in the industry, these are terms that you're so familiar with um, that you, they roll off the tongue quite easily. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time because they are important when you get into, into looking at the payment industry. In the box in the corner, there are four light blue um, squares um, called issuers, acquirers, cardholders, and merchants. And they're really the key players in the payment industry. Issuers are the banks that issue credit cards to cardholders. Cardholders are simply the people who use credit cards, so consumers, but people buying goods. They shop at merchants, and merchants, the, the bank that stands behind the merchants and gives merchants money is um, the acquirers. On top of those four boxes, you can see a, a, another box with, that has dark blue squares in it called the card schemes. These are the commercial entities that make up the rules that help the credit card world work. So there are entities like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, um, JCB and Discover, um, which aren't as popular in my market, but in other markets are very popular. So the card schemes effectively make up a whole set of rules that people can sign up to and follow, and they help this ecosystem work as a global market. Um, credit cards is, has had a globally interconnected network for a very long time. When I first started in the industry, which was um, back in 87, um, they already had an interconnected network where electronic transactions could sail around the world within seconds. And at that point in time, that was an absolute differentiator. Um, no, you know, only the credit card companies had those networks. Nowadays with the internet, we all have one of these networks in our pocket and uh, it looks like every business imaginable is trying to work out how to get value out of those, that, an interconnected system. But it's something that the card brands have had for the last 40 years. One of the things they worked out with having an interconnected network where people are not with each other is there was a problem with fraud. Um, how do you know that the person who's presented themselves is really the person that you think? So in the early days, they had paper cards. They went to plastic cards with mag stripe chip cards, um, contactless cards. Um, pin numbers, biometrics, a whole lot of things to try and make sure that you are who you are. And what they basically worked out is all the schemes worked out that um, having interoperability was handy. You didn't really want to have merchants having lots of different terminals or payment gateways. You wanted one. 
um, and the security rules were all similar. So on the far left hand side you can see a box called PCI and that's really what PCI is. It's, it's the card brands have got together and said let's make up one set of consistent rules which makes it easier for uh, people in our industry to understand uh, what the rules are. On the bottom um, and right hand side of the diagram you can see a whole lot of uh, yellow boxes called merchant agents. And this has really changes that have happened over in the past 10 years or so where um, instead of banks and merchants providing a lot of infrastructure, there are now a whole lot of third parties that have got in and help organisation achieve their, their need. Um, shopping carts, call centres, we're posting um, services. And effectively this is the way all industries are going where we're putting things in the cloud, where um, um, we're very interconnected nowadays. So the issues that have been facing the card industry for some time is now um, being faced by many industries. Over to the next slide. Um, I've got a, a story of, of an online retailer. Um, we'll get stuck straight into that and we'll talk about Jenny's story a little bit after um, it completes. It's an online cosmetic store. I don't think I could have predicted how popular it was going to be. Just the rate at which my client base was building was unbelievable and the turnover, it was amazing too. Tell me about your website. Ah, oh, the website, beautiful. A friend of mine's a web designer and she did such an outstanding job on the theme of it. It was a 1950s old time glamour. Uh, I just, I got excited and I cut corners. I got a call from my bank letting me know that a hacker had accessed my website and had actually accessed all of my customers' card details. So their cards were being used all over the globe. I was mortified to say the least. What was the result? Well, I had to shut down my website for weeks and rightly so, while they conducted their investigations. Oh, and I might have to pay for the forensic investigations, which my bank said could be over $15,000. And I just don't have that kind of money sitting around, especially not now. And on top of that, I have to pay additional compliance costs, which, you know, it's all because I didn't think through things in the first place. What about your customers? What was their reaction? Well, some of them called me and told me about fraudulent transactions that had been made on their cards. So they actually had to cancel their old credit cards and wait for new ones to be issued. And others didn't even call me. They just went straight onto Twitter and voiced their opinion there for the world to see. So my reputation is pretty much stuffed. How's that affected business? Well. The website is back up and running, but it'll be a really long road to recovery. I haven't made anywhere near as many sales since the incident. It's just it's really hard to get people's trust back. I know I wouldn't feel comfortable shopping on a website if something like that had happened to me. Okay, so... Um I hope you liked Jenny's story. Jenny's story was actually put together by the Australian Payments Clearing Association, which is a self-regulatory organisation of the Australian banking industry and a working group was put together, which I was a part of with a few others. And it was a part of a series to really help um, retailers understand the advantages of online shopping and how it was full of opportunity, but also be cognizant of some of the disadvantages of it and not make um, not make ill-informed decisions. Jenny's obviously an example of a very small retailer whose friend built a website, but really some of the negative comments that she touched on, reputational risk, um, losses, fraud investigations, um, ongoing monitoring by the industry, these are faced by all organisations regardless of size. So if, you, if, if you're a bigger company than uh, Jenny's, small um, company, a lot of the things that she was um, bringing up apply. So that's really a, an example of the payment industry. I want to talk a little bit about um, security and compliance um, because the two are interrelated but different. 
We're in the middle of the digital revolution. Information security governance is simply the new operational risk and the costs associated with, with the implementation, maintaining and assuring your business is digitally robust are only starting to be felt. Digital services will continue to grow and consumer facing businesses and the businesses serving them will need to prove their products are digitally safe. Uh, that's attributed to a wise person. A wise person said this sometime this year. Um, I, I really believe in this. You know, we we are entering into a world where everybody has an interconnected system in their pocket, and uh, industries everywhere are trying to work out how we how to innovate, how to make this new technology um, a part of their new business models. And the opportunities are absolutely huge. But understanding the digital risk that come with new technology is something that we have to be mindful of. And this is where we start talking about the difference between compliance and security. Um, I looked up my favourite um, my favorite dictionary, uh, Wikipedia, for, for what does compliance mean? And it just basic, it's basically a pretty meaningless word. It just says to follow the rules, to comply to the rules. So when you think about compliance, the real question is, well, what are the rules I'm trying to be compliant to? Why are they there? What's, what's the purpose of those rules? Not understanding that is not paying the program and your money and your business enough credence. You really need to dig into what, what do the rules actually mean? Um, I do a lot of talking about PCI to lots of people. And this is part of a, a talking session that we normally have. And I'll talk about the slide, the little diagram, the cartoon on the bottom right hand side, which should be a pretty familiar um, picture to most people. Obviously a soccer pitch, someone's got a penalty shot or a shot at the goal. And, you know, of course you would build your walls of uh, defenders. You know, it's, it's obviously something that you do because having a wall of defenders absolutely helps stop the shooter scoring a goal. It is a helpful thing. It is something that you would do every single time. But would it stop a skillful um, attacker scoring a goal? Of course it won't. Oh, they're just going to kick it around the penalty wall unless, unless uh, they're having a really bad day. So of course you would supplement your, your wall with other people, a goalie, some defenders and stuff like that, to try and stop the goalie, I mean the attacker getting a goal. And I think that's a great example of the difference between compliance and security. Compliance is relatively static, security is more dynamic. On the top diagram we have um, some people, a cartoon of, of a criminal in the background running away with data and some very smug technical people in the foreground talking about how they've put in their latest source code scanning vulnerability checking software. Uh, again, it's not about the tool that you have um, and installed. It's about how you use the tools and, and thinking about this problem. And we're going to go into that a little bit deeper in the presentation. I find that when we do PCI compliance, we sometimes um, get um, people disappointed with um, the amount of effort they've put into the security work. And when they get their report on compliance, the results are relatively poor. I don't know if you can make out the grades on this person's scorecards, but no, I can assure you they're all E's and F's. And you know, this person, uh, the, the student, obviously doesn't think that's very reflective or important to, to his life and just wants to throw it away. Um, and I see this in organisations. I see people when we do our PCI compliance assessment, they have trouble relating the scoring and reporting mechanism to what that means within their organ, uh, to their organisation and themselves and just want to throw it in the bin. And it does mean something, and I, later on in the presentation I'll talk about what problems PCI actually does solve. If you just focus on the compliance score, you're really missing the picture. It's, it's not what it's about. It's not about the certificate. I wanted to introduce a maturity capability model. Um, this should be familiar to people and, and especially people in the software industry, which is where this uh, version of the maturity model has been taken from. But the point I wanted to make is that maintaining good security status is not simple. 
Um, it's not as simple as just running a project and putting in some technology. It's about being able to repeatedly perform a task at a desired quality. And uh, realistically, to become a PCI compliant organisation where you're compliant most of the time, you really have to have a maturity around your security operations around that four or five level. And many organisations are nowhere near that four or five level. So that's really a goal. In, in the PCI world, we talk about a journey a lot. It is a journey and it is hard, but it's a journey well worth going on. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, the journey and why it's, in, uh, it's worth in, uh, investing in a QSA. QSAs do many things, um, but one of the things we probably do a lot more than other, um, other tasks is we're living this journey with our customers all the time. And we're used to talking to executive management, to workers, to, to everybody in between in your organisation and trying to get them to understand what the cultural difference is. So even though formally the role of the QSA is to do an assessment, I think that QSAs bring a lot to the picture um, than just the assessment. I've got a picture of an overloaded car and I wanted to talk a little bit about safety in the physical world. And you know, I'll actually talk about safety a little bit. Um, my two up bosses, Spanish, and we were having a, an interesting um, discussion about the difference between safety and security. And he actually smiled at me and he said, you know, Mario, in Spanish, the word safety and security is the same word. Um, and so we worked out that there probably wasn't much use um, trying to dif differentiate the difference. Um, it's easier to think about safety than security, and it's easier to think about the physical world than it is the cyber world. So I want to take you to thinking about the physical world. Within the physical world, we understand safety pretty well. From a very young child, you, you know, you fall over, you bump your head, you realise that, um, you know, you need to hang on to the rails as you go down steps because if you fall, it hurts. Um, and there are a whole lot of things that we do in the physical world around security and safety. Um, when we drive our car, we put on seat belts. Um, you, you don't drink and drive. Um, but there are a whole lot of things that we know affect our physical safety. So on the next slide, um, I've got an unusual situation. Um, we've, we've got some guys in a pool with a, a table in the middle. It looks like there's a radio on the table. Um, they needed to get power to the radio. There's an extension cord in the middle of the water. And obviously there are some physical safety issues in this picture. And I'm sure if I said to most people, what is the, the, the safety issue in this picture, they would circle the electrical power board and say, you know, you, you don't put high voltage electricity into water. But I want to draw your attention to the guys. They, they don't seem too concerned about this. They, they're sitting there drinking beer. And, and what I do in my training, uh, I sort of try and draw an analogy between um, if you can imagine not being knowledgeable about electrical safety and say that's similar to not being knowledgeable about cyber security. Um, these guys are drinking their beer every day, nothing's happening. Um, you know, they, they could quite easily argue, why do I have to worry about electrical safety? Nothing's happened. That's not important. You know, I once heard about somebody in the US getting electrocuted, but that's not me in my swimming pool. Um, so not understanding the risks is something that changes your opinion around safety. In, in my country, if you were uh, asked what was the biggest risk in this photo, and you weren't aware of electrical safety, you would sit there and say, the beer is not in ice. This is, this is a big problem in Australia if your beer is not in ice and you've got your mates around for a swim. So what I really want to do is challenge people to think about um, safety and security and the cyber world and think about PCI in that context, not in the compliance context. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to um, introduce the five things that I think the PCI really solves on a day-to-day -day basis that is not about a compliance certificate, but really helps your organisation move forward. So what problems is PCI, DSS really trying to solve? 
The first one is PCI DSS is a well-defined global definition of what is expected in any entity that has an association with cardholder data. It explicitly has a whole lot of rules, um, over 300 rules of what you're expected to do. And they're, they're in English and it's been translated into lots of other languages. I know there's a Chinese version. Um, uh, both simplified and um, traditional. Um, and it tells you exactly what you should do in your cyber security space to help protect um, your organisation. The big advantage of this is that they're actually measures. Um, so it's a controls validation exercise that says go in and check whether this um, information is documented. Go in and check the settings on a router. Go in and, and look at, at your logs. Go and check that your logs are, are actually being viewed. And we all know that what gets um, measured can get managed. I walk into a lot of organisations where they tell me that their security is great, yet they still fail, um, or it fails the wrong word. They don't go well on their PCI compliance status score. And the main problem is, is they're not measuring they're doing a great job. So they think they're doing a great job, but they don't have the measures. And this makes it difficult to explain to your senior management or executive management how you're going. It's far easier to argue um, what you require or need for your job, especially in the cyber security space, if you've got some objective measures um, behind you. So that's the first problem that PCI DSS solves. In this slide, I talk about standardised reporting on organisation security status. So we've got a little cartoon, two little stick figures. Um, I want you to concentrate on the things that are crossed out because the things that are crossed out are actually uh, important. Um, in the start, one of them is saying, I'm funnier and smarter, and the other one saying, I'm prettier and kinder. And they all decide that in the end they're going to be um, politically correct and they're all going to agree that they're all awesome. Within, P within the PCI standard, one of the things that, that it drives is the ability to not only know what you're measuring, but to have standardised reporting and a way of communicating the outcome of your measure to other parties. You can actually work out whether your organisation is pretty or not pretty, is smart or not smart, and you can work that out on, a, on your individual basis. But not only that, within the payment um, system ecosystem, PCI DSS is used to work out whether your service providers are providing you with good security governance or not. And that is exactly one of the reasons behind PCI DSS. The card brands wanted to understand which banks are doing good security governance and which are not, and which merchants are doing good security governance and which aren't. And as a merchant, you can find out whether your um, hosting service provider is um, meeting the expected requirements or not. Um, Jenny, if she got her friend to her, her friend who created her website, um, if she gave her friend the PCI DSS standard and said, look, there's a bit here on creating websites. Do you do all of these things? I'm pretty sure her friend would have said, no, I don't. I just make it look beautiful with beautiful colours, which is, which is the bit that Jenny was really impressed with. So the second thing that PCI DSS gives us is an absolute way, absolute as in a quantifiable way, to compare not only our own organisation to an expected standard, but also the organisations we decide to partner with. And as we enter into this cyber revolution world and, and an interconnected world, understanding the cyber security expectation of other organisations you partner with is a pretty important thing. The next slide is a high level view of the actual PCI DSS requirements. And at, at the very low level, PCI has over 300 detailed requirements. They bubble up to the 12 requirements you can see on the right hand side of this slide. 
And those 12 requirements bubble up to the, to the six that are on the left hand of this slide in bold. And I must admit, when I'm talking to people about PCI, when I'm talking to the executive management, the little six requirements is plenty enough detail for them because all the rest is just um, detail. Um, and if you go over what those six requirements are, it pretty, make, pretty much makes sense. Um, you need to build and maintain a secure network and systems. You need to know where your sensitive data is. You can't hold a data for the payment industry, but if you're in other industries, it might be other data, might be personal identifiers, it might be um, some R&D information. You need to protect your, R, your data. You need to maintain a vulnerability management program. You need to make sure that you have strong access controls and countermeasures. Um, make sure that you, you're not sharing logon IDs that everyone has one when people leave, you make sure you get rid of it. You need to regularly monitor and test your networks. Um, sometimes we build things and we think they're secure and when you go and test them, strangely enough, you find they're not. It's, it's important to, uh, they, they say you should inspect what you expect. If you expect your system to be secure, test it. And if you find it is, that's good. And if you don't, you, you can fix it. And the last one is, is to maintain information security processes. So um, the reporting you get from PCI is effectively general information security reporting and it's handy to all. It's not just payment system specific. Um, Parts of it are around the protect cardholder data, but that can be abstracted to other important data types if you need to. So what's the next benefit? Um, it facilitates the ability to transfer some costs associated with poor security. Um, within the payment system, this is very important and it's one of um, the key um, the key values of PCI to the payment card industry. As I described at the start of the presentation, payment card industry is an ecosystem. There are lots of different players. And sometimes just because one of the pay players in the ecosystem has had poor security, fraud occurs. But the fraud might not be felt initially by the person who had the a poor security. More often than not, it's the issuer, the bank that has issued the credit card to a cardholder that gets the fraudulent charge. But within the payments industry, there's a way of transferring costs through um, people within the industry to the entity that um, leaked the data or did the wrong thing you know, at a high level. And comply the PCI DSS measurement system allows a way for forensic investigators to go in and check whether the entity was keeping up its end of its agreement um, it's a contractual um, agreement it has with somebody else in the ecosystem. And there are sometimes um, tools within the system that allow the cost of the fraud to be transferred over onto the entity that wasn't doing the right thing. Um, it's a very powerful tool that you need in business models where you have an ecosystem as distinct from a straight business to business model. So. Um, for, for people who are going to cloud service providers um, and they're providing a service to someone else, thinking about liability if your supplier does something wrong and how that might play out in your industry is something that is well understood in the payments industry and been going on for a long time. The last problem that um, PCI solves is one around a quality mark. Um, the organisation I work for, UL, um, is, is well known in the US and around the world, not so well known in my market in Australia, but it's well known for measuring the quality of electrical systems, um, food, toy safety, and there are many quality marks that we see on products all the time. And the value of a quality mark, um, even if you don't understand what, what, what is the test that went through, is that when a person purchases a good with the quality mark, they know that some independent level of checking is being done. And definitely there are benefits to organisations being PCI DSS compliant and being able to show that quality mark to their potential customers. Um, and, and you can 
drive sales by being PCI DSS compliant and having that quality mark, especially if you're in the payments industry or you you service customers within the payment industry. Where it's of most value is if you're a service provider and you sell your service, be it either, either goods or just straight out services, to people within the payments industry because PCI DSS is the expected standard. So it might be nice to say I do ISO 27001 or it might be nice to say I do any of the other security standards, but their expectation is they want PCI um, and your story to them becomes a lot easier if you have PCI. So like most quality marks, um, it's, it's good to understand what they are and it can be of great benefit to your organisation. They're the, the five, thing, five problems that I think PCI really solves. Um, we actually had um, Tripwire um, come to us and say, you know, we're selling our product to a lot of people who have PCI. And, and we were talking about, you know, how, how can we best explain to them um, the benefit of our, our product and PCI? And the answer was quite simple. It was to do a, a third party analytical review of their product and write very much a, a black and white paper on how does the tripwire product, what requirements does it meet? Um, how do you confirm that the product has been configured the right way so it's actually achieving those measurements? And how, if you were to do an assessment, would you um, confirm that the Tripwire product is meeting its goals? And so we ended up coming up with this white paper. And I've got David Bell with me, who, who was the, the um, technical um, Tripwire representative on this paper, who worked with our audit team, who went through and, and uh, did all the technical work. I was lucky enough I, did, I didn't have to do the technical work. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a great document to um, not focus on the marketing side of the paper, but just mo focus on the, the pure technical side of how does Tripwire help with PCI. And I've got David with me. Um, David, how did you find the exercise of going through uh, a technical PCI review of your software product? Well, Mario, that's actually, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that was actually one of the eye-opening things for us, I think, was that it was a very thorough, technical, regimented process. And I sort of did note down a couple of those items that we experienced, and that's uh, when we approach customers, it is a case of, here is our product, um, here's what we can and can't do. Um, but when we were assessed by your auditing team, it was also about not only the marketing side of things, that the, you know, the bells, excuse me, bells and whistles, but more about how our product adheres to PCI. And that was one of the more interesting things I found. It was um, that we were being assessed, that there were components of our product that if we were placed into a PCI zone um, may actually be an issue, so that we had to have those ticked off as well. Um, and that sort of, that was one of the most interesting things I found. And that does lead to my second point was um, that it wasn't just ticking a box. Um, that PCI is not, as you mentioned before, not just about the certificate. Um, it, it shouldn't be considered just, we'll do some best practice and that's that. Um, it should be part of normal risk mitigation. It should be part of security uh, process within an organisation. And that when we have a customer saying, look, I've got a QSA coming in in two weeks' time, I need your product, um, you can tell the difference between that and a, a, a company that is mature enough to have us in early and say, look, we, we are working towards security best practice. Yes, we hold credit card data. We do have to adhere to PCI and work down that part, that path. As we mentioned before, it was a journey. And that was one of the interesting things I found, that having your guys go through our products and, and, and really sort of be thorough and interrogate them based on that as well. Um, and so the outcome being, uh, obviously, the white paper that we have. Um, when a customer comes to us, based on an independent review, we can tell them that using Tripwire and PCI DSS 3.1, we can cover six objectives and 62 of the requirements they must adhere to as part of that PCI audit process. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was good to get that independent review of, of how this can be done and have your auditing team actually go across it. And so that's what we've really learned. Um, what I did want to cover on was um, the products that were actually involved 
before you go there, actually, I, I want, I want to just, uh, I think you made some great points. And I, I think the point that you made that different customers are at different levels uh, of, of the journey. And it is a journey from, from when you first start and, and you might be more focused on, on a product to when you're in the middle of the journey and, and you're tuning and defining what your organisation is actually doing to the end where you're just PCI compliant year after year. And we actually find that a lot with our customers as well. And the other good point, the great point that I think you made is that your product and any tool that you put in or any software that's in the environment is a part of the ecosystem and it's important to make sure that um, the tool itself or the software itself is um, compliant and and not and doesn't actually make your overall security status worse. Yeah, and and one to to follow on to that point, um, I think we spent probably a 50-50 amount of time between proving that our product could do what the marketing documents said it could do, and proving that we would fit into a PCI zone, yeah, and that no. our product itself would actually adhere to those requirements as well. Yeah, I did. My wife wasn't aware of that. that yes, no, it was it was a good process actually. Yeah, that's great. great. Sorry, I interrupted you. Can, can no, you. That's fine. Um, so the products that we actually um, that we submitted for your guys to review, the first being Tripwire Enterprise, uh, which was policy management and tightly integrated file integrity monitoring. Um, so being able to one work out what's going on in an organisation using file integrity monitoring, you know, good change from a bad change, but also report based on the PCI DSS standard um, and configuration assessment in an organisation. And so that's. That's something that Tripwire has done for quite a long time and is, is uh, an industry leader in it and are very, very good at doing it. So that was quite easy to, to show for your guys that we could do that. Um, and it, that goes to the next uh, point being it establishes a known trusted configuration baseline for a security policy, in this case uh, PCI DSS, um, whether it be a hardening config, and also catches that configuration drift. So we have um, the ability to report on a continuous basis. So when a customer actually puts that in, we can tell them that if you've passed your audit, well, once you guys have come in and assessed them, but we can tell them that they're straying away from that, that known baseline of the configuration point, so we can help with that. Um, Real-time alerting on change and audit detection, um, and also remediation guidance built in. So um, if we run a scan and we tell them, well, PCI zone's not looking great, you, you know, you've, you've failed these particular tests, we can tell them what they need to do to actually work towards that, that compliance and pass those tests. Uh, the next product was IP360, which is a vulnerability assessment tool, um, which gives you also automated discovery of your environment, um, giving you visibility of hardware and software, whether it be in or out of that PCI scope. So you can actually just do a complete discovery and work out what's actually in that zone or what might I need to actually start making some changes to uh, within the PCI area. But also gives you a scan based on um, a vulnerability assessment, so it gives you um, an automated uh, report to say, look, these particular zones or these particular areas, uh, you need to go and fix. There are some serious security risks here. So it gives you that, that uh, business context around it. And what I really like about this is, I know as an auditor sometimes when we walk into an organisation once, once a year and we can tell they've just done a whole lot of work a few weeks before we've walked in and invariably they're the organisations that really struggle with PCI and we really try to encourage as best practice doing the tasks that you need for security on a daily basis as a part of, the, of your business's usual processes and making sure that they will drop out what you need for compliance. So realistically on the day that we walk in, um, you don't have to do anything different. You're already doing the work. And to me, this really shows the difference between a compliance-focused mentality versus a security-focused <coughs> mentality. And so having tools that allow continuous um, notification and alerting and the ability to check problems and produce the artefacts on a daily basis, as distinct from just before the audit comes in, is a huge value, huge value. Uh, so we also submitted uh, a couple of other products for assessment as part of this, this process. Uh, Tripwire Log Center, uh, which provides security event correlation um, and ingests uh, essentially any security uh, information in a log sense um, from, from a variety of sources, correlating that information and then actually giving some sort of event of interest, whether it be um, if we're relating to PCI DSS, that 
administrator accounts are logging on where they should actually be changed from a default as per the requirements with DSS. Um, but it also provides encryption, compression and storage of those raw logs for forensic information later on. So again, storing those logs for 12 months uh, in a really accessible uh, environment. Uh, we also submitted Tripwire Pure Cloud uh, for PCI, which is our uh, online ASV certified scanning uh, for an external uh, component based on IP360 infrastructure. And also Tripwire Secure Scan, which is actually a, a free and easy to use online while they're limited scanning service with reporting to help you find vulnerabilities, again, based on Tripwire IP360 infrastructure. And so all those particular products were submitted and put through the rigor uh, with your assessors, um, and the end result being uh, the white paper, which uh, those on the call and the, uh, the WebEx are able to download by the link that we have there. So my understanding is in the white paper, um, there's, there's not a lot of the, the marketing spill in there. It's pretty much a black and white assessment of exactly of how those products and tools um, can be used to meet the specific requirements. Yeah, exactly. And that was, I sort of refer back to one of the, the first points I made, was it, it was really a rigorous and thorough um, sort of investigation. It, it felt as though, I, I sort of felt sympathy for the customers that we come and see, is that <laughs> we felt like we were going through that order process and yeah. um, it was a very thorough process. Okay. And, and I know that we've had a lot of uh, comments back from people who've used the document, um, even from other QSAs, saying that they've found it a, a worthwhile resource um, to understand how to audit and and uh, work out the tripwire solution. <coughs> yep. Fantastic. Okay, so what are the takeaways? Um, for me, the main takeaways uh, the, the cyber threat world is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and that if you're not doing anything now, you need to start because it's just going to get more ugly out there as, as we get more and more systems interconnected. Um, within, within the internet connected community, there are going to be people who are going to try and profit off um, the information they can get their hands on. Um, as we have more non-payment systems, um, people trying to invoke processes on the internet, um, our information is actually becoming more valuable, your, your address, your phone number, your social security ID. And, and there are people who are trying to take advantage of that information. So as, as I was saying, if, if you're not thinking about how to manage, this is just operational risk, in the world today, um, which is something that all businesses should do is think about their operational risk, is to start, if you're already started, um, the rigour that um, any compliance program, whether it's PCI or anything else, but the rigour that a compliance program can help bring to your organisation to understand your deficiencies, to understand the other organisations that, um, that you're dealing with is, is something you should do immediately. And that really brings me also to the second point, is, is don't wait for the knock on the door from, from some auditing body or some bank saying that you've had a data security risk. Mm -hmm. Think about compliance now. Where, where compliance can, can actually help is that um, you will be able to demonstrate to the parties that have been affected that you weren't negligent in the running of your operation. And when we start entering into a world of um, possible liabilities, um, uh, being able to prove that you've done a good job is, is very important. And I think uh, probably my key takeaway would be that PCI compliance is not just that tick in the box. It's not just about the certificate, um, but it is a, a business process journey. So that um, you do need all, all people on board when you go on that journey. Yeah. Um, but I think one of your points you've made before is that if you if you do go through that journey and you do get your business processes right and the security processes right, the certificate will pop out of the end. You are doing the right things working towards that, that uh, the PCI uh, compliance. That's great. And uh, that brings the, the end of our, our prepared slides. Um, Melanie, Hi, Mario, I do have... and, and you. David, thank you very much um, for that presentation. Um, I hope that everybody on the call uh, found that informative. Um, 
I certainly enjoyed uh, listening to that. Um, we do have uh, a number of questions that have come in on the line, and if anybody would like to ask any further questions, uh, I can remind you just to use the Q&A um, widget at the bottom of the screen. Um, so I'll have a look through the questions that we've had here. Um, so, so the first question, um, I think this would be uh, one for you, Mario. Um, there have been um, PCI DSS compliant organizations that have experienced data breaches. Um, Target in the US would be an example of this. Does this just show that PCI isn't worth the money and the effort? Um, what, do you, what, do you, what would your response be to that? No, I, I think it shows that depending on how you do your PCI DSS um, and journey and, and, and what you get out of it, it can not be worth the effort. Um, if you definitely have a compliance mentality that you're just going to put in the tools to make the auditor happy and you're not really going to think how it interacts with um, the actual running of your business and your operational risk, you can have a complete set of of tools and and you can be found compliant, um, yet you're not really doing the activities that manage your risk. Um, Target in the US is is an interesting example. There there has been um, some um, information that's leaked out um, around how the attacker got into the system, and it was via uh, supposedly I should say uh, this isn't fact yet. But according to the reports, um, credentials of, of an air conditioning um, person was used, and once they got into the network, they were able to move around other parts of the network and, and get to um, the parts where cardholder data was being processed, and they were able to collect that cardholder data and get it out of the system. Um, and so, you know, the ability to understand um, who's logging in and when and why and how data is moving around your network would have been things that may have been able to have been done to prevent um, items like this. Um, so, I, I, so to answer the question, <laughs> let me not ramble, to, to answer the question, um, I think if you have a security focus on doing your uh, work, that it's of definite help. If all you if all you are is compliance focused, you can spend a lot of money and not really achieve a lot. So you really have to think about it. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Mario. Yes, I think the um, you know security uh, focused mentality versus compliant focused mentality is a, is a really good point. Um, so the the next question that I have here is. Um, does PCI apply to all merchants and banks or just some? And how, um, how can organizations tell if, uh, if the requirements apply to them? Okay, I guess that's another one up my alley. Um, it's actually a really hard question. Um, the need to keep cardholder data protected is a requirement on everybody and every organization that stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data or can affect the security of the environments that store, process, and transmit cardholder data. So everybody is expected to secure and keep safe cardholder data. However, within the payment card industry and within the ecosystem, not everybody who's a part of the ecosystem is required to validate their compliance. And within different markets, within different countries, different things occur. So. Um, Within the U.S. market, um, they they're, um, they they like to litigate when things go wrong, and so there's a lot of just um, organisations that will question PCI compliance as a part of, of that process. Within the Australian market, um, our banking community has only focused on certain players and only asked certain players to. Um, confirm their compliance status. Um, I know in the in the UK market, uh, Melanie, where you're from, um, the fining for non-compliance is, is quite common. So it really is a market by market um, situation and a, a organisation by organisation, depending on your volume and who you have contracts with. So it's not an easy question at all to answer, but I can give some guidance. 
if you're not sure whether you need to, so everyone should be compliant. This, this just makes common sense. This is just security, you know. If, if you're not compliant, you're leaving the door open to criminals, and I don't think anyone wants to do that. Uh, whether if you need to validate your compliance, you should talk to um, your bank if you're a QS, uh, if you're a merchant, um, or if you're not a merchant, you should talk to the entity that has given you the data. Um, and that's how you can determine whether you need to validate your compliance. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Mario. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that did. Um, so perhaps uh, perhaps the next question, uh, David, um, you could um, you could provide uh, your thoughts on this. Um, so bearing in mind what Mario just said about the importance of um, of PCI compliance. Where should a company start? Um, you know, there's, we talked about how there's 400 requirements. Where should they focus and how, how should they get started? Uh, that's interesting that that question actually pops up. Mara and I were discussing this uh, yeah. just prior to, uh, to the WebEx starting. And we actually both had two, uh, two different approaches which, which ultimately sort of ended up at the same spot. Um, from, a, from my perspective, I think uh, anything would be a good start. Um, however, uh, getting some sort of visibility over your organisation uh, and uh, whether it be with Triple R, whether it be with anything, uh, working out what's within your organisation or what you are trying to achieve, uh, where, whether you do hold credit card data in the first place. I mean, these are sort of, sort of basic questions, but some kind of visibility. Um, and we also refer a lot to the SANS Top 20, which uh, include in there inventory your hardware and inventory your software feature in the top four. Uh, pr pretty basic stuff, but at least know what's there, and you'd be surprised uh, how many companies just don't know that. Um, and Mara, I'm going to your thunder, but I, I think you have a different yeah, yeah. take on, on that as well. So, so my take on it was um, we're running businesses, and businesses are about making money and making sure that you've got that understanding of the focus that having good cyber security is important for the money-making potential of your business is an important thing to have because you've got to get the executive management, the people who have the purse strings to, to and set the priorities for all your organisation on board. So I think when I was talking to David, David's you know technical, so he's like he's he's trying to solve that technical problem. Um, as I was more focused on making sure that you do some work with the organisation and spend some time with them and get an understanding for them of what does not being secure or not being compliant mean for the robustness of the business from a money-making perspective. Um, I said this during the presentation, if you're a service provider providing services within the payments ecosystem, um, you will find that practically every contract you sign will ask for PCI DSS compliance. And it's, having that compliance is just a no-brainer. Um, if you're outside that, that uh, sphere, then it comes down to, well, how could um, digital disruption affect me? Affect me? Um, you know, we've just had talk talk in the, in the, in, sorry, in the um, European market talk about a data breach. And, you know, people are becoming more sensitive to these topics and, and it does affect your business. And you should talk to your business owners around what would the effect be? And I, I guess I want to bring people back to Jenny's story. Um, even though she was a very small business, the same things that she brought up there are, are things that it can affect bigger businesses. They, they're just multiplied. Thanks, Mario. Thanks for, for that answer, both of you. Um, very interesting. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so, um, PCI DSS uh, 3.1, which has recently been released and is covered in the in the Tripwire and UL white paper, had changes to SSL. How can um, organisations ensure that they um, stay compliant if the goalposts keep moving? Um, yeah, we, we actually got this. 
Yeah, 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 no, down my alley. Um, we actually got this question a lot where people, especially, you know, when we're about to walk in and do an assessment and there's a new version and, you know, they, ha they haven't had time to prepare. And look, there were some special rules around um, uh, handling those merchants. From a security perspective, we've known that SSL's been a bit on the nose for a while. Um, and realistically, the change to version one was just the compliance requirements catching up to whatever, whatever you know, stuff in, in the security world we already understood. And to me, it gave us really clear insight into our customers that were security focused. The ones that were security focused, um, they knew that they should have been moving off SSL. Most of them had already moved off SSL and the compliance requirement just catching up to something that they already knew from a security perspective was, was not a hard migration. The, the customers that found it really hard were the ones that are trying to drive their security function based on compliance requirements. And that's just not a place you want to be um, because really you, you just um, running your organisation based on a set of rules that somebody else is making up. Um, I know if it was my company, that's, that's no way I'd want to run my organisation. I'd want to spend the knowledge on um, uh, understanding what's happening out there and managing my operational risk. Thanks, Mario. Okay, um, so thanks both of you for answering some of those question and answers. Um, any that we didn't have time to cover today, um, we will be following up with people after the call. Um, so I would like to once again thank uh, Mario Sis and David Bell um, for their participation today. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed uh, today's presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and also to the slides. And I hope that you will join us for future webcasts. To find out more, uh, you can check out tripwire.com. And you can also um, check out our blog, State of Security, which has lots of news um, and information. Um, and that's everything that I want to cover. So thank you. And have, I wish everybody a lovely afternoon. And um, look forward to seeing you on the next Tripwire webcast. Thank you.